Hello, and welcome to the Rojas Report, our special uh, interviews, exclusive content just for our subscribers. And uh, hopefully we'll have, we've got a couple people joining live, but uh, hopefully we'll have a few. I did put this together kind of last minute. But we've got a great show here. We've got Anthony Lepe. And am I saying that correctly? You nailed it. I think I asked you that last time, too. But uh, you are the showrunner and executive producer for Unidentified, and congratulations on launching the second season. Thank you. Thank you. It was not easy getting that on the air in the time of COVID, I'll tell you that. Oh, right. And from what I understand, you had to even make the season a little shorter. Yeah. Unfortunately, we had we, had, we were planning on two more episodes Um but it just we had all a bunch of shoots set up uh, for March that we had to shut down. And uh, we decided not to try to, you know, stretch material or, or you know, kind of make something out of nothing. So we just we fortunately, the network was was OK with us just delivering the eight. Mm hmm. Well, I want to get into uh, to begin with. Uh, I was able to interview Chris Mellon, which was great. I saw that. And, uh, that was really interesting. Yeah, thank you. I, I was really excited to be able to do that. I over all these years, I haven't been able to talk to him personally. Oh, oh, great! Oh, interview, oh, so that was my first one, and I kind of froze up a bit because I, I finished my questions and I was like, uh, and I had I could have asked so much more, but oh well. I was able to get though a good story out of it for uh, Den of Geek regarding how uh, much unidentified the television show was able to help with uh, getting the Senate Intelligence Committee to ask for these UFO reports from military agencies. And he said quite a bit. Um, I mean, is that surprising to you? Uh, no, but it's it, it's not surprising because, I, you know, I've, I've, was been, I've been on the inside of it for the last two years. I th I've never been involved in something uh, like this, though, where I'm both following a group of people um, who are investigating something and then actually the the product of you know w what I captured also had an effect on the stories you know what I mean it's kind of a right. circular right. kind of meta weird thing that uh, you know I, I've never done a show like that that's had such a tangible effect um, on both public opinion and you know actual things on Capitol Hill and in the Pentagon. It's, it's, so it's, it's surreal, honestly, actually, <laughs> to tell you the truth, uh, uh, because I saw it happening, you know, uh, Chris had been working on this, you know, uh, behind the scenes stuff for years, going back to the first season. You see a little bit of that happening in the first season, you know. Uh, there's a, a whole process by which we interviewed uh, Lieutenant Ryan Graves, right? We took uh, a video of uh, that. We we did about a ten minute piece of that interview, and um, Elizondo showed that to Mellon in Washington D.C. And then they he actually took a tablet uh, with that uh, video on it uh, and met with um, members of Congress and showed him the. Uh, that and so that's all you might people might not remember that it was a short scene in season one but um so yeah our invest our show has been has been part of this whole ongoing story in a very interesting way right i mean as an investigative journalist uh which is your background you've covered a lot of uh typically you know as investigative journalists you you cover topics that you feel need some more attention um and what has happened here is kind of the ultimate goal, which is to really make some change. And it's it's kind of odd that, you know, UFOs is the thing that you're, you're having. Exactly. I, you would have told me five years ago this was going to be the uh, the show that sort of had the most <laughs> kind of uh, effect on, on both public opinion and actual lawmakers. I would have I said you were crazy. But uh, but that's what's been so exciting about it. It's just such a it's such a amazingly fascinating endless mystery and it just keeps getting more interesting honestly by the week I, I it blows my mind everything that's that happens every almost every week now on this ongoing story it's really a live story right mm -hmm. um so 
Yeah, uh, yesterday yeah. I think Marco Rubio made some comments or, or the day before about, and he didn't back down. He was like, yeah, this is a big deal, you know? Yeah, and it's been going on for years, you know, basically confirming exactly what, uh, you know, Elizondo and Mellon have been saying. I mean, it's, it, the other really fascinating part about this story, right, as, as an investigative journalist is, you know, I have these characters who, you know, they really do have one foot in the government. Right. Mm -hmm. They they have clearances. They are actively meeting with these uh, people who are making these decisions. Um, so and, and they are still very serious about their uh, non-disclosure agreements and, and they're in maintaining their clearances. So, you know, they, they can't say everything they know. Right. Um, and they can't even allude to the things that they've actually seen in a lot of ways. So it's a very interesting story because they are not, you know, I always say to people, uh, you have to remember, these guys are not whistleblowers. They consider themselves sort of still performing the duties that they were when they were in the government. They just, you know, couldn't, they hit a wall inside while they were in government and now are kind of, you know, coming out from the, from the outside. But they are still very much... And, and you can read that, you know, both ways, right? You can, I think it still is a very legitimate question to ask. And I, I don't, I take no offense. And we uh, explore this question as well as we did in the first season, asking the hard question of, well, can what they say be trusted? Are they still acting as intelligence officers? That is a completely valid question to, to ask and uh you'll see in season two we asked that question just in the same way we asked in season one because i, I think it's ir it's irresponsible not to act, uh to ask that question journalistically mm -hmm. um that's i have my own opinions but i don't i don't those are you know they, they don't count really you know i tr we try we're trying to you know be as transparent um and and, and um journalistically sound as we can um, mm -hmm. But I do think those are legitimate. But I don't think it, I don't think it's disingenuous to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you can you can look at what these guys have said and how they act, and, and people can judge for themselves. And and the, and this I think uh, the whole cycle of uh, Pentagon statements and revisions and is just fascinating. I, I still don't really understand what's going on there. Um, but remember. Right. In season one, this is what's interesting. And I, people, there's like parts of season one that I feel like people don't remember. Uh, maybe they have, they were in the, in, you know, in the last episode, but, and it, they, they are short scenes. But remember in season one, Elizondo says there's an ongoing effort. Uh, that's, and he meets with two guys and a third guy, if you remember, in a hotel uh, that we, right. we shot from a that. distance. And um, we hid their identities, but um, you know, he he called it and said that there was an ongoing effort. Didn't and I, you know, we we were able to check that out, and um, it, it appeared to be legitimate. That's why we reported it. Um, you know, I, I know some of the names of those individuals. I was able to to see some correspondence and things that proved to me that that seemed appeared to be true, um, and that's why we included it in the show. So actually that, you know, that's actually not new. We, we somewhat broke that story in season one. So the fact that now with the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee um, calling for this multi-agency task force and, and um, you know, uh, revealing that there is an ongoing effort is something that actually, you know, we talked, we, Elizondo has been consistent saying, you know, mm -hmm. So that's just, it's fascinating, but I just, I, I, I'm not taking, I'm not trying to say this to take credit, but I, it isn't, um, these are these are elements that um, these guys have basically been working on ever since mm -hmm. Blue left, you know, in 2017. I think you can take credit because, I mean, you're doing investigative journalism with the show. And what's interesting, and, and I, I'm interested to hear what this experience was like during the first season, uh, things such as Elizondo saying this is an ongoing project. Uh, you know, the ATIP and its affiliation or what it was purposed to do and his affiliation with it. All of these were in question. I mean, everything's pretty much been resolved and it's come out that 
your show was accurate. Elizondo was accurate. It's only even recent, you know, just before the second season aired that the DOD admitted, essentially, right before the, the Senate request uh, was revealed that this was an ongoing effort with a, a task force and multiple agencies involved, just like you reflected in the show, like you said. was Were you nervous about kind of these, what was coming out with the DOD and everybody kind of... Oh, oh definitely. Yeah. I mean... Uh, you, you might want to step into your mic a little bit more, Alejandro. People are okay. noting that, yeah, I, I, you're a little low, so low for me, too. Thank you, uh, Stacy, for pointing that out. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that was like, you know, uh, from as a producer and a journalist, when uh, that, uh, what's her name, Susan Grove statement came out, <laughs> that was like, I was like, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was pretty, uh, that was a shock to the system. And, uh, you know, it's still confusing exactly what's going on there. I mean, Lou is explaining, I mean, I don't think he really fully understands what, what the, you know, what was actually going on behind the scenes there. That is some, you know, Byzantine uh, deep state stuff that, uh, you know, obviously I'm not privy to, and I'm not even sure he understands at this point what, what the game that was being played there or whether it was a game, whether it was just, you know, uh, people not being in the need to know, you know? Um, so, uh, but it was, yeah, it was definitely, you know, we were just gearing up to start the new season and it was just like, what? <laughs> That's a twist. How do, how do we incorporate that? Um, so we just kind of took a wait and see and let, let it play out. And, um, you know, we try, as you see in the show, we try not, we don't go too much because in some ways, this is a popular show, right? It's a show for a mass audience. So it's not about the Lou Elizondo story and his trials and tribulations. Uh, so we just, we kind of were, took it as a, a wait and see situation and then saw, you know, as it, the succeeding statements came out, um, it kind of, you know, resolved itself, at least to some degree. I mean, there's still lots of mystery and murkiness. Bro. I mean, if you're an investigative reporter, you know, people like, Greenwald and, and McMillan and um, MJ Bannis in particular, those guys have been doing some great reporting all around this that uh, has definitely informed us. Um, but that, that wasn't the focus. Like what ATIP, uh, you know, our show is not about ATIP and what ATIP was and what Bass was and what Bigelow did. And those are all fascinating um, stories, but that's the network, you know, fundamentally what didn't want to, you know, focus on you know what happened in the past they wanted to focus you know being a show popular show uh for a mass audience they really wanted to focus on stories on in engaging evidence and stories and that's what we did and that's what we do to you know kind of segue to talk about this season you know i think that's the exciting part about this season is there's just as you saw in episode one there are four new stories every episode has three to four sometimes five never before heard stories um, so it's just, I think it's, uh, the entertainment value of this season, we were able to really up the production value, which I'm very yeah, proud of from a you know, producer's point of view, but, um, but it's just fascinating. You're just going to, we spent a lot of time vetting those stories. You know, I, these, most of these stories came from people emailing us. Um, you know, we had a call to action at, at the end of the, uh, the episodes last year. Some of them came through connections to Elizondo and other people contacting TPSA and some of our other sources. But that majority of the, the, the cases came through this email system that I spent most of last summer reading through these emails and then vet and then sort of whittling the people down and then vetting them and talking to them. And, you know, sometimes people didn't want to talk and we got them to talk. Sometimes you'll see some people wanted to remain anonymous. Um, yeah. So, uh, but it's fascinating. I mean, the trove of stories that came in um, were absolutely amazing. And we really tried to focus on a diverse range of kinds of stories, of locations, of different branches. We have people who have intelligence, we have Army, we have Navy, Air Force. We have, you know, we have everyone uh, involved. And, uh, but anyway, that's, that's the most exciting thing that I hope viewers appreciate and are, are entertained by. Because, um, you know, this is a TV show. We're trying to make something entertaining. What I think was exciting, too, hopefully, and let me know if people can uh, hopefully hear me better or if there's still an audio level. 
But another thing, exciting part of this that Chris uh, Mellon had talked about along the lines of just what you were saying is that these cases that you're now presenting are actually part of the strategy to get information out of the government in that some of these cases that you're covering demonstrate there were investigations done by these different agencies that should be coming out in these reports that the Senate has asked about. In particular, he talked about a NORAD case that will be coming up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, some of them were, uh, yeah, very high level, you know, NORAD command. Um, and uh, stories of, you know, I never heard the light of day. Uh, some of them are like if you saw in the, in the, in the first episode uh, where you have instances of after action reports being, you know, issued or, or uh, film being confiscated and classified. And, you know, we tried in vain to, to do FOIAs on some of those. And, uh, yeah, I mean, most of these cases included uh, some sort of action after action report, in, in particular, the the, um, you know, the ones involving pilots. Uh, there's a very interesting case coming up uh, that launched uh, a larger DOD investigation that um, will be in a later episode um, that we you know, haven't been able to find out much about um, as wow. well. So there's a lot of things that we've, a lot of stories that we've, you know, just kind of, this show in some ways is like the tip of the iceberg. We're getting the, the first-hand accounts, and like like a lot of these UFO stories, right? It just takes years, right, for the multi-layered uh, pieces of information to kind of leak out and other people to come forward, right? So this is almost like a new wave of uh, witnesses that uh, hopefully will spur further investigations. Mm -hmm. Now you talked about the the second season being kind of. Uh I think you called it more professional, which I, I think it's, I agree. I, I loved the, the first episode. I think it feels kind of like you've got your own thing now. You've got your own professional, credible way in which to demonstrate, uh, to show this information and interview these guys and have your own space to present it. That's unique. It's edgy. It's Thanks. professional. Thanks. Um, so it's really exciting going forward, and I've heard a lot of great feedback. Has the feedback been pretty good uh, yeah, on your end? Thanks. thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think the first season was professional. It's just the, the production value, and the, we, you know, really tried to bring the these uh, um, sightings alive with, you know, as you see, these dramatic recreations um, where we were using a lot of real military hardware to shoot with, um, which was really fun, just as a director. Um, and then we have a lot more visual effects where we're taking their accounts and we were really working with these guys to like tell us, you know, how big, where was it? What did it look like? So we worked very hard to try to really uh, illustrate uh, visually what they were talking about, you know, in terms of everything down to the size, the shape, the way the lights moved in some cases, you know, the way they described it, the noises it made. Um, the i'll give you a hint actually about uh tonight's episode um is really cool it's one of my favorite it's really the it's and it, it's very apt that you you got to talk to chris mellon this week because uh tonight's episode is really his mission hmm. um he is uh on a mission um to investigate the great you know giant triangle mystery which is something that is, it's like kind of his personal, I don't know if a lot of people know, but he's personally fascinated by trying. I didn't to, know that. That's that, interesting. Yes. So we, and we have two never before heard stories from incredibly credible wow. witnesses from the Gulf War era uh, wow. in the Gulf War theater. Um, and that, you know, what's so interesting about the triangle mystery is it's clearly connected you know some people are clearly seeing some sort of military crap right there's definitely enough evidence you know in terms of where they're seeing things and what what the craft were doing but then there's just so many other accounts that don't add up um to anyway it's a fa it's fascinating i think people are really 
there's a lot of story. We have a lot. We have a new witness. He goes uh, to Utah and meets with a former uh, intelligence officer who just had a very recent uh, uh, incident. And he, had, he even has some photos of it. Um, but it's you're, what's t exciting about tonight's episode, and it, I think the other thing that I'm excited about this season is, um, even though this show is not uh, about uh, Melon and Elizondo, right? It's not a biography of them. Um, we really try to focus on the witness stories and 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 you know what they're seeing and try to examine that. You do as you watch this season, you will get to know these guys a lot better. And you'll start to hear them speaking in ways that they didn't speak in the first season. Hmm. Um, so tonight is a great example. I'm not going to give too much away, but tonight is a very good example of you're going to hear Chris Mellon speak in ways that I don't think anyone's ever heard him speak. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, I, I'm going to interview David Marler next week. He's a good friend of mine, one of yeah. my favorite researchers. Love I know that. he'll be in the episode. Yes, he's, he figures prominently. Uh, Mellon goes and meets with him, and they have a fascinating conversation. He's just he's got one of the most incredible troves of, of research I think I've ever seen on any topic. Uh, mm -hmm. Fascinating guy, really smart guy, and was incredibly generous with his time and his research. Uh, and uh, it's a great meeting of the minds, you'll see. Uh, they had a great, really, so it's a real interesting. It's really exciting to hear also that you have uh, new triangle cases because, of course, Dave, David follows him closely and anybody who follows him, you know, knows a lot about the big cases. So, And that's one other thing that's great about the show is that you're presenting new cases that are credible military cases that no one's ever heard before. Yeah, yeah. This one is... Uh, Technically a civilian, but he's a he's former military intelligence. Mm. So even even in our civilian cases, we have another instance like that um, in another hot spot uh, where we go to North Carolina. You know where there's been a lot of sightings, and we have a former Marine, very high level. Well, not high level, but a real badass Marine commando, recon guy who had a sighting off um, the Carolina coast that uh, just, you know, he just cannot explain. And Did it terrify him? He was pretty freaked out, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and this is a guy who was a, a Marine reconnaissance, you know, going behind the front lines, you know, up in the mountains, you know, Af Afghanistan kind of a dude. So not an easily scared guy. The yeah. other thing that I'm really excited about uh, – is the um, we have a whole episode of, with uh, never before heard civilian um, uh, airline pilots, including wow. active active pilots and some recently retired guys. Very very experienced flying. You know, I think we don't mention the airlines, but for to say major legacy airlines in the United States, and they have that is just incredibly captivating because it really brings home. These guys are, were super freaked out, you know, they're because they have 200 souls, right, that they're responsible for. And there's these things that they're seeing. And, and in one case, what I think one of the most dramatic accounts that we have, something that comes very close to an end. Um, so I am excited for, for the response to that episode as well. I think people are going to be surprised because we've been so focused on military kind of uh we switch it up and we've got these just really great guys too these you know pilots are just you know you gotta there's something about the bearing of a of a pilot they're all you know i think they were all ex-military I mean, if, if not most of the guys mm -hmm. uh so, you know and these guys take their jobs these guys you know every time they go to work right they have 200 people's lives in their hands right think about that responsibility yeah. day, right so this these were like serious life life altering experiences for them that, uh, you know, like the same way these military pilots, you know, they can't shake. Mm -hmm. that, that's what you, you find in this season, you know, uh, there's a lot more, there's a lot more emotional things that happen. We've got where mm. people are, you know, really are like, really kind of had, had life-changing moments. Whereas I think, you know, when you, 
uh, you know, Commander Fravor and even Graves. Those guys are fascinated, you know, and I think it definitely kind of has changed their worldview a little bit. But they're they're very, I don't know, they're you know, they're they're cool cats, right? Hmm. Like Fravor is just like I want to fly that thing, right? I remember right. that to me. And Graves is just he's like a real intellectual, actually. He's just kind of perplexed. But uh, we, th- there's other people that you'll meet, you know, who you who. who it really changes their worldview and uh, in an, an emotional way. So mm-hmm. I'm excited about that part of the storytelling as well, just from the mm-hmm. filmmaker's point of view. I, I'm really interested in that part of the story. Yeah, that's really interesting. Are there other, um, I guess I was going to say surprises, but I guess revelations that you're really excited about this season? You know, I don't want to give too much away. And I, yeah. I off, off the... Um, you know, yeah, I think I think I'd rather just let it let it play out. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a lot of things. It just there's a lot of things that happen. You know, we go down to South America. Um, a lot of some interesting things happen down there with Lou, um, and we meet with some very interesting people. Um, and uh, you know, there's just yeah, there's just a lot of stories. Uh, I don't, and and I think it's it's really about building this big pattern. You know, I, I, that when you watch it all together, it's just like there's just the patterns that emerge um, are fascinating. I find. Mm-hmm. That's, that's that, a, yeah. one of the uh, the most uh, negative comment that I heard, I have heard from people is a repetition of the Nimitz material. Yeah. yeah, now, yeah. I, I didn't really have a problem with it because I know you have to remind the audience and not all the audiences live with this UFO right. stuff or pay attention to it as much as those like myself and those I've heard feedback from. Um, is Was that something that people just saw in the first episode and, and won't see as much going forward? Yeah. Or? Well, you know, here's the tricky thing. You know, the, the, your, the, your audience is just a, a real subset, right? Yes. You, you know the Nimitz incident inside and out. Probably every single person listening, right, like me, knows that incident inside and out. But for the vast majority of, of viewers, it, it's it's new information um, mm-hmm. or it's information they have only seen a headline about. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it was something that the network, you know, we tried to, I, I tried to streamline the storytelling more this season to, to have a little less, you know, there's definitely... Uh, a style on the History Channel that that tries to hold your hand a lot as as you move through. Mm, right. Um, you know, I'm definitely come from a more of a filmmaking. You know, just kind of let people, uh, you know, put the two and two together themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, there is something effective to it because it does it. it there is you know some satisfying. Neuro connections that are made, and, and you help. You know, you have to. Not everyone knows this stuff, you know, and it's, yeah. it can be confusing. So you can't just say, like in two thousand four, right? Right. You have to say, like in two thousand four, when the USS or pilots from the USS Nimitz saw a pickback and it did this and this and this. You just, you, unfortunately, you have to kind of. You have there. There has to be a minimum amount of, of context if, when you're trying to put it into the whole thing. So it's definitely something that we really tinkered with, and it's tricky, you know. I, it's, it's it's how do you draw connections and create and talk about patterns without being repetitive? That's definitely a, it was a major uh, kind of editorial conversation that we had. Put that mm-hmm. way. Um, so, but I hope you know what I think is cool about this season is because there's so many new stories, we're constantly moving forward, you know. And there's just new information and new information and new information. So, you know, like that's what that's why it's that's for, in particular why the network wanted to air uh, tonight's episode as a second episode because it's it's you know it's nothing to do with the minutes. It's all about this whole other, as you know, universe of triangle uh, sightings and theories and and um, counter theories, right? Mm. So that's its whole. It's like its whole you know cottage industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, but it's a good point. It's a fair point. Um, definitely. Well, I get it though, because I when I write articles or when I do my podcast or interviews, every time a case comes up, I do my best to encapsulate uh, the gist of that case. So 
uh, it's something I try to do, and I know viewers and listeners appreciate right. because, like you said, not everybody's up to speed, and a lot of times we've got someone brand new, right? And exactly. uh, so the, they need that background. And another important point about this season, which is different from last season, um, which was is made it a little trickier as a filmmaker, is they wanted these episodes. The, technically, this season is not a, a serialized, so each episode stand it needs to they. The direction we got was each episode needs to stand on its own. Mm. So if you're just watching this on a replay later, you know, in 2021 or something, that mm. uh, you wouldn't have to have seen the second episode, the, the first episode for the second episode to make sense. So they're they're more they're more self enclosed in that way. Mm. Uh, so uh, that made it you know a little different. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, speaking of triangles. One of the things that really strikes me about those, and I'm wondering if you have the same sense when you began investigating it to prepare for the episode, um, is that there these sightings seem much more bold. Like often other sightings, the objects are at a distance or they zip off very quickly. Whereas with triangle sightings, they're right above the road. Yes. They're right above the witness. They hang out for a period of time sometimes long periods of times before they float off, sometimes lingeringly, you know, slow right. before they take off very right. fast. That that's is, what mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, th I mean, that's one of the major points, actually. Uh, the other interesting thing about actually, actually about this season is there's there are more voices from TTSA are going to get involved. Hmm. So uh, without giving too much away in what they say, in tonight's episode, you're going to hear from some of the other players uh, in TTSA um, and there, uh, and one of them speaks very much to that exact part of the phenomenon. Mm. That what the, if this was a military craft, why is it lingering, floating really low, uh, over a house, a civilian area? And why is that repeatedly happening? That's mm. a, a huge part of the story that is perplexing and fascinating. Uh, speaking of, you know, these these discussions, like we had this kind of analysis and discussion in the first episode, one of the things that this show does well also compared to other reality television shows is that it doesn't feel scripted, even though obviously you have them positioned in a, in a location that films really good. But they're like other shows, including sister shows on History Channel that I, I won't name, you know, right. feel very, very right. scripted. Right. You could tell right. they're. Uh, they may be even repeating something they already said, but it right. just feels scripted. You don't thanks. really get that in uh, Unidentified. How do you get around that? You know, thanks. I, I, I really appreciate that because, well, first off, I'm not a reality. I've never done a reality show, so I wouldn't even really know how to do it. But but I also wanted to make sure it never felt like we were doing it, even though we weren't doing it. And sometimes, I, I'll, I'll be honest, it's hard because, you know, uh, Elizondo in particular can't is, is um you know he also he can be very formal sometimes in the way he speaks mm. um so we definitely you know just to, you know try to like when they're having their discussions really try to just say hey guys just pretend like we're not here uh like there's a and that's actually one tonight's episode has a really good example of that where we get the team the larger team together to talk about the triangle phenomenon and I think people are going to be, and, and we really are just, you know, all we're saying is triangles go, you know, we're not trying to say, okay, can you set this up? And can you, yeah, I mean, and also these, you can't tell Chris Mellon or Lou Elizondo what to say, right? I, I just, <laughs> that's not something that, uh, you know, you're really able to do. These guys don't take direction, you know, mm -hmm. like that. So, um, but thank you. I appreciate it because, yeah, we really tried not to, um, you know, we, we tried to make this show really as organic as, as possible. Obviously, mm -hmm. there is a, you know, an artifice of, of, you know, for instance, I don't think Lou would have been going to South America if we did not um, decide to go there. But in going there, he organically, a bunch of things happened because of his connections hmm. um, to some of the military uh, personnel then that uh, is completely organic, you know, that wasn't contrived, as, as we'll see. Uh, so, you know, there's, you know, it's still a television show, you know, he's still going out um, 
and just you know the resources we have they it wasn't you know i don't know if they really have the resources for 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 us to be doing all the invest you know we're sort of you know uh our production is, is able to go places, let's say, that, that may, we wouldn't necessarily be able to go to on a daily basis, right? Um, so that's also the, you know, I think the benefit uh, for everyone is that we're, we're able to, you know, support this effort in a way and, and to get more, I mean, really all, what this show is all about is just getting stories out there and finding credible stories and vetting them as much as we can and uh and letting people decide for themselves and you know the other part of this season which some some of your viewers and others may get annoyed with is uh we we, we uh, even more so are, are offering countervailing theories and evidence and and i think last season we we didn't have uh as many voices that were offering countervailing uh but technical explanations for things it was, you know, sometimes it was more like Chris, I mean, uh, Lou and Steve Justice sort of um, devil's advocate, you know, game, gaming it out, right? Whereas now we have uh, guys like Bill Scott, you know, who's a former Air Force test engineer uh, who had a lot of experience in black projects. who was an aviation Week editor for years. You know, people like that um, and other even in... in uh, people who are sort of skeptics, like uh, Clark in the UK. Uh, I, I believe he was in episode one. He himself. was, yeah. yeah. So you know all about him, right? He's, yep. He's definitely a, a skeptic. So we're really offering those voices as well, because I think it's important to hear those those voices. And um, because, that, and then also just from a storytelling point of view, it's you know I, I enjoy hearing these. Um, uh, these countervailing points of view it makes it just more interesting. I, mean, I, I agree. That's what that's what I think most. I uh, not to critique other shows, uh, you know, but that's always kind of the problem with uh, UFO shows in the past is they always are trying to. You just can't really believe what you're seeing because it's so clearly trying to push you in a particular direction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I loved about the first episode, and then. And it also, you know, um, you, you're putting out all the information. Uh, you have experts who are all looking at that information. And then some of the things, like David Clark, honestly, you know, some of his comments really seem kind of uh, out there. You know, they don't fit along the lines of what some of the experts are saying. Um, and they're more experts on some subjects than, than he is. So I think it's really fair to really encapsulate the information. And you, what's really interesting about the show, too, is that the witnesses also become experts because they are experts. They're pilots. Um, right. Oh, yeah. And so their input, you usually don't see that. Usually a witness is a talking head as opposed to kind of jumping in and, and joining in on the analysis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what's so, I mean, who knows more about what is flying in the air than, you know, these these guys. I mean, there's a there's guys who uh, coming up really fascinating story from a, a from a FAA contractor who has a really interesting uh, visual uh, on a craft in a very remote location. And um, but it, like for instance, his experience. I don't even know if we even talk about this in the show. But like he had been trained as a uh, uh, anti-ballistic missile, uh, you know, operator. So mm. he, was, you know, at, well, what he, he's studying the profiles of craft, right? Like every single known aircraft, he has to know the profile and the characteristics of, right? These, these people are, and that's fundamentally the DNA of our show, right? We're finding these people who have been, I, I think we even, I, I, when I think about it, and I say this out loud, we probably underplay that. We probably should if we had more time on these shows, really get into the the amount of training and what it goes into each of these, these you know these people's roles and how much they really understand aircraft and things like that and and how train how much training goes into every one of their their uh, you know uh, positions because I think that then that's why I think that's why our show had the impact 
it had and is having because these people they're not you know a military person isn't necessarily a better person right or, or more honest than anyone else it's but they are trained in what is flying and what an enemy looks like and what a you know in, in physics and things like that i mean ryan graves you know had a degree in aeronautical you know phys uh, aviation uh, things like that so these are these are really highly trained people they mm -hmm. are as you said they're experts right and it comes across in that they speak the same language you know being in the military and having that experience chris uh elizondo along with the military witnesses uh and the engineer the aerospace engineer uh not just steve justice but the other guy uh who with from aaron space magazine i think he's from uh, they speak the same language, and so they kind of are typically on the same page about things and explaining it similarly, which I think then adds to, you know, people uh, backing up what they're saying as far as their expertise, um, especially when they're kind of digesting and mulling over maybe things that David Clark is saying, you know, they're putting their take on it. And uh, so I think that comes across that these guys, you know, they know what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. One of the interesting uh, things that happened last season, you got a hold of me and you said, uh, there's something that's going to happen in this episode that looks scripted, but it wasn't at all. And I think it was the Guadalupe Island show. Oh, yeah. And right. I watched it and I didn't see anything that felt scripted. And I don't know that I've asked you, what was it that you felt might have come across scripted? Well, I, I don't I, think it did. I, I guess it was the scripted. It, 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 it just like, basically to recap, it, so you know people know what we're talking about in in episode three of season one we go down to, you know we kind of follow the trail of where kevin day the radar operator on the princeton said the craft and we don't know necessarily if they were tic tacs or not but the craft the multiple craft that he was tracking on the aegis radar were all flying in a particular direction and they would disappear off their radar uh down near guadalupe island which is a, a small island off the Baja coast, right outside of their uh, the Navy's exercise area. So we decided just like, heck, let's go down. It was a really big risk, honestly, from a production point of view, because it cost a lot of money to charter. We chartered a whole big boat, right? And it's very complicated to go to Guadalupe Island because it's a nature preserve. Mm. And you can't land on the island. And, all, and there's like a fishing collective there. And it's, it's a great white shark. Um, breeding ground so um it was very complicated uh to, in shooting overseas is always complicated shooting in mexico is complicated right so long story short we go down there and we we hired a great uh local producer um and he basically starts just doing some pre pre research and starts talking to all these fishermen from a, fi a the fishing collective that basically splits their time you'd have like some kind of small uh shacks on guadalupe and they're the only people that are allowed to kind of be there other than the mexican navy um so we go down there and basically like 10 of these guys all start talking about seeing basically tic tac like craft and them seeing flying up in and out of the water going back like decades and and then we find a uh spotter a, a tuna spotter who flies a small plane who had a uh, sighting of a thing that looked, sounded, moved, and it was so eerie. The way he described it, z z zigzagging in the air, and then when he flashed his lights at it, you know, which is like a kind of aviation thing to say hello, right? It flew right at him past his nose, which is exactly what Fravor said the Tic Tac did at the end, right, of their, their little... Uh, interaction it kind of zipped off but kind of in a very kind of freaky way for them because it came so close and it went so fast so mm -hmm. it, and then you and then we go to the island and not only we found more fishermen there on the island but we found this legendary great white shark uh researcher who himself had a site and that i just i couldn't when they got back with that footage i just was like i just couldn't believe it <laughs> yeah. from a, you know, from, I, I honestly, I'm actually surprised more people that show that episode. Even actually, it was our highest rated episode, actually, but it didn't get a lot of ch like people don't talk, still talk about it. You know what I mean? And I'm surprised that that's not part of the narrative more. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't know whether people, because they're, they're, they're discounting them because they were just kind of local fishermen and they weren't experts. But honestly, people like local fishermen, like people like farmers and fishermen who are out in nature and are like know the skies and conditions and they know the difference between bioluminescence and not, right? Those are people that are experts too in their environment, right? Mm-hmm. So when they were telling these stories, it was, that blew my mind, honestly. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things that really started to push me in, in a, a direction of like, wow, this is really something that is unexplained. That's what I thought it might be. And when I watched the show, I think even Stacy, who's in, she runs the Arizona MUFON or chapter. And I was watching it with her and other friends who do UFO research. So I think that we were all like, yeah, that's what happens. Um, but I asked around, too, just to kind of get a sense. And just like you said, uh, which is good, you know, nobody, I didn't, nobody had said, oh, how did all those people witness it down there? Everybody would kind of accept it. It was like, wow, you know, holy cow. Yeah, They're it's having good. lots of sightings down there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, which is really good, which is interesting. And, of course, Kevin Day and has gotten together a group of, and, and some scientists, and they're going to go down there and do an expedition. Yeah, is, that, is that actually happening? Are they going to get down there? I don't know. I know that it, it's going to take a lot of money, and I'm not sure if they've raised it all, but they're planning on it. And at least the last I've heard from Kevin Day, he's very positive about it happening. That's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not easy to do anything these days. Right? It is definitely difficult to finish the show. As people will see, we had to, you know, kind of the last 10% of the show, we had to do a Skype interviews and things like that. Ah. So you'll see more of that. What about your colleagues? I mean, being an investigative journalist, um, they probably, especially with second season or first season, were maybe, uh, you know, oh, this is interesting. But, I mean, they really have to be shocked that, you know, what you've done is is literally some of the cases you've talked about and and exp- shared with the public, or have now made it into you know the Senate Intelligence Committee and briefings to the senators. Yeah, I mean, definitely when I began before we went the first season went on the air, a lot of my friends thought I'd gone crazy. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, "What are you doing? Are you sure you want to do that?" And I was like, "I don't know, man. I just I I can't." not follow this story it's so interesting it, it, you know you know if, if i just gotta i gotta stick to my guns i gotta do it the right way but how could you turn away from having access you know a front seat to this narrative and and being able to roll around with chris and lou for the last two years has been you know how could you not from a journalistic point of view you know yeah that would be crazy so i think a lot of people Definitely a lot of my friends were like, oh, okay, now I see why you were mm. uh, so interested in this topic, because it seems it's a lot bigger than, uh, you know, what they had thought. Mm-hmm. So a couple comments uh, real quick from that are in here. AccuPunk is saying, and I'm not sure necessarily what he's asking, but maybe you'll get, get mm. it. Super cuts of foreign surveillance teams chasing Lou and Chris question mark. So I... Thinking. Yes, uh, I think I might have given given a little tip away on another podcast that I did, mm. but there is a there we do have a uh, instance where we're being trailed by uh, some very seems to be clearly uh, foreign intelligence. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. But of course, happen. when you have someone of Chris and Lou's stature, given their backgrounds, um, they probably get that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This this was though this was interesting in the context mm. because I'll give you a hint. Uh, okay. It was they were appeared to be uh intelligence officer or you know, agents of some sort or security agents, etc. Some sort of agents of a foreign government, but not of the country we we were in. Oh wow, that's very strange. Yes. Oh, yeah. can't wait for that. How long are we going to have to wait for that? Is that late in the season? Uh, I got to look up um, what episode. It might be the fourth episode. Oh, cool. So we don't have to wait too long. Yeah. Awesome. So another comment. The Unidentified series has legitimized the subject where other shows just couldn't do that. 
It has made a huge difference to both seasoned ufologists and the newbies out there. Great job. And this is from Stacy, my friend at Phoenix. Thank you. Move so on. And then nice to finally have reliable sources. And I think that that is something that people don't get. And when it comes to journalism is the importance of expertise and credible sources. And I think a lot of people in this community, the UFO research community, don't always get that either. But it seems to be something that is definitely should be for every journalist, but it's something certainly paramount to you producing the show. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think and that's why these military people are so interesting, because they really do, even if they're not in the service anymore, they really have a lot to lose because of the, the straight lacedness of the, the military. Um, so their reputations and their names are really, you know, paramount in the, in the, in the legacy of their careers. So for them to come out and, and be an outlier and talk about something that's kind of weird and kooky in military culture is just, you really have to, that has to come into play when you when you look at their credibility that they're willing to come out and say the stuff and that's that's the big theme right of this season is you see all these guys who are telling stories that they've held some of them 30 40 years some of them are much more recent but these are all stories that they haven't told anyone publicly and uh we're a lot of them were very nervous you'll see uh, that's why we try to show some of the stuff where you see guys the kind of behind the scenes when they come in and sit down and you know this is like a, some of them are pretty freaked out about the ramifications. I'm still in touch with a lot, all, they're all emailing me, you know, like, when is it going to air? I want to wait till, you know, to, to know when I should turn off my phone because I'm going to get, <laughs> you know, basically yeah. hazed by my whole, you know, unit. Uh, so they're, they're, they're nervous. They're very, some of these guys are very nervous about the show, their participation in the show and what, how their uh, colleagues are, you know, who, who, who's going to come out of the blue. It's like, look, there's, you know, Sergeant whatever, or Lieutenant or even Lieutenant Commander, whatever, uh, saying something, and then they're going to get blasted. And, and uh, so I give them a lot of credit, you know, and yeah. I, I appreciate it because it's, you know, that's what, that's what made our show possible is their bravery really in coming forward. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people feel like, you know, there's, there's a, suppression of this information like these military guys are told not to share this information but in my experience it's more along the lines of what you're talking about they're they're just they don't want to share information and they're kind of self-editing themselves Definitely. because of the ridicule and the you know they don't want to be a subject of this sort of attention yeah that by by a couple instances there were guys who said they were forced to sign an nda mm -hmm. but vast majority of this is just yeah just wanting to keep it quiet um we have a story coming up that's really interesting one of the most dramatic stories um where we and then we have a uh a, the second witness who also witnessed it from a different vantage point and we call him and this is really the kind of emotional interesting most psychological and emotional uh twist in terms of these where, where basically they both were, they were in a National Guard unit. They both had the same incident happen to them. They both went out and talked to, told their unit that day, right? And they both got totally ridiculed. Hmm. And the second guy, not our main source, but the second guy kind of turned on the other guy and was like, oh yeah, we were just joking oh, um, wow. at the time and kind of hung him out to drop. So when we called him to to corroborate he, he was like yeah you know i feel bad uh because all those years back i kind of left my partner out to dry because i couldn't handle the, they were all wow. and i couldn't handle the ridicule but mm -hmm. here's what happened and he tells us this is totally independently from the other guy tells us his story from this different vantage point totally i mean slight differences and you know kind of a subjective experience but tells the same story of the same seeing the same craft right and uh, and and, f and says, you know, look, I feel bad. I feel bad. I wow. that I that I, uh, I let him. I hung him out to dry all these years. I've always felt bad about that because apparently it was like a big deal. It really affected uh, them. And you know, again, that's what's so people 
uh, you know, one, I'd say one of the negative things about the military, if you learn about military culture, and I don't want to speak too much because I'm someone who's never served, but having been to Iraq and, and other, and have been embedded, and know people who have obviously served, um, you know, there definitely is a culture of hazing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I've played a lot of sports, you know, it's similar, right? Yeah. So, uh, there's a, definitely a macho hazing. I don't think that's going to be a news flash or controversial to say no. culture of hazing uh, in that, that can be pretty intense in the military. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's a, there's a culture of conformity, right? So, uh, yeah, that's that. And we get, so I, hopefully you're going to learn more about that. Mm -hmm. this, 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 see it, you know, firsthand. And I guess my but, last question, cause we're, we're kind of gone uh, about an hour here is, um, I know there are a lot of people in the woodworks who are interested in this topic, but afraid to share their interests. Um, not just high level officials, but also uh, celebrities. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you could share names if you want or not. But uh, have you heard, you know, from uh, some high level officials mm -hmm. or celebrities saying, hey, whoa, this is I good wish. Stuff. I wish. I, <laughs> yeah, not really. I mean, we definitely I have heard. I mean, for every story that you see on the show, there's about 10 more, right? Mm. Of people who have contacted us. Right. Um, and some of those stories are super compelling, but for whatever reason, like they didn't want to come on, or sometimes it's like just a little bit too secondhand of like, I saw a video, like we had a story, I don't want to say too much about it, but a very uh, interesting person with a very high level position within air force and nasa tell a story wow. um but it was a you know it was secondhand it was like i saw a video or something so we didn't mm -hmm. you know didn't have the video so it's like can we really make that into a story of just seeing some something you know kind of secondhand it just it, it just wasn't enough there and, I, and the first so um but there's a lot more and we're still asking we're going to put up coming up in the new episodes Build, the call to action is going to be up there. The email um, at, uh, you know, is, I, shoot, I don't know what I'll talk about, but uh, the email address uh, is live and we're still, you know, people are still coming in. We've gotten some of the stories that you'll see in this episode. I mean, in this season, we're late breaking that just came in. You'll see because they're, the, you know, you can tell by the ones that are on Skype, right? Uh, those are all post COVID stories that, uh, that have guys coming forward to Lou and the people are coming forward to Lou all the time. Every week he's forwarding me something from someone coming to him. Uh, so you'll see a couple of those stories that uh, came in in the last couple months that were just, you know, were too good that we had to get in. Awesome. That's so exciting. So uh, excited to watch the show in just a few hours now, uh, episode two, but thank you so much for coming on and sharing this information. Um, these are some really exciting times and, uh, the show is right in the middle of it, uh, kind of steam rolling all this information through. Yeah. Well, so are you Alejandro, you know, you're yeah, definitely thanks. doing a great job with all your reporting. I really, I really love reading your articles and, and again, I appreciate all the support and a uh, big shout out to all your supporters as well. I think you're one of the best guys I, I've said this before Thank on you. it on this topic and uh it's great that you have loyal supporters and, and uh, keep up the great work well thank you thank you very much and of course the feelings mutual you, you're kicking some butt over there so thanks so much for that all right thanks man and yeah let's touch base like uh, you know i want to hear more uh you know if you want to do a uh, uh, kind of end of season wrap up or something i'd love to chat with you okay and, and get more feedback from you and your viewers definitely uh, great De all right then we'll make that happen Excellent. All right. Bye, everybody. All right. Tia, thank you. And uh, yeah, bye to my listeners. Uh, I know I had talked about getting Lou Elizondo on, and I will be able to do that soon. We're working on it, but uh, lots of more exciting people, including we'll be talking to Dave Marler. So you'll be watching him hopefully in a few hours on the show, and we'll talk to him about the show next week. We'll do, in fact, probably a couple interviews with him because he's a good buddy with a lot of great information. So. That'll be great to hear. I'd love to, I'm going to tune in because I'd love to hear what Marler thinks about the show. Obviously he hasn't seen it. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear his reactions to how we, uh, how he's we excited. It. He's yeah. really excited about it. And he loved meeting Chris Mellon who wouldn't. Um, so yeah, 
It's going to be good. Excellent. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you.